and welcome to the spring fall policy wilt phi kappa phi lecture I'd like to make a couple of announcements before we begin by way of introduction first I want to introduce one of our two student vice presidents Gabe Grabowski Gabe you can just stand for a second Gabe will be introducing the two respondents to tonight we had our in initiation banquet just last Friday and had an electronic vote for the two student vice presidents. I don't think they are here tonight, but it was told that it would be announced. Chena Underhill and Charlotte Combrink. So I don't think Chena or Charlotte, either one, was able to make it. We have a special guest tonight. You notice the title of these lectures, the Paul C. Wilt Phi Kappa Phi Lecture Series. And I'm delighted to say that Paul Wilt can be here for this lecture. Paul, could you stand just for a second? Paul was one of the founding members of Phi Kappa Phi, and I know uh, for a fact that at times before it got into the budget, he would out of his own pocket pay for the honoraria for the speakers and respondents. I don't think there's any lecture series like this at Westmont. It's where a faculty member gives a talk for about 45 minutes, a scholarly talk. <coughs> By the way, one of the other founders of the society, Robert Wenberg, used to quip that one of the mottos for these series should be bore us but don't insult us. <laughs> uh, there ought to be a Latin phrase that goes along with that. Um, uh, so this will be a scholarly talk and then followed by two respondents who will criticize the talk. Now for you students, <coughs> criticize does not necessarily mean that you pick it apart and disagree with it. You might well agree with a lot of it said, but you also will perhaps give some criticism of it. Uh, the main talk will last for 45 minutes. The two respondents will go 10 minutes each. That is a very hard task to say something succinctly in 10 minutes. Mark Twain is quoted as having apologized for writing a lengthy letter to a friend by saying, I'm sorry for writing such a long letter. I didn't have time to write a short one. So you students, as you go on, you'll realize the wisdom in that. It's very difficult to make something very compact. Tonight, we're very pleased to have as our main lecturer, Dr. Martin Asher, who came to us from the Wharton School at Penn Un University of Pennsylvania, which for you students is one of the most prestigious business uh, institutions in the US. He was a uh, director and research uh, of scholar, he was the director of the research scholars program at Wharton, and he won the William G. Whitney Award for Distinguished Teaching, not once, not twice, but six times while he was at Penn. He's going to speak, uh, speaking tonight on issues relating to federal price fixing schemes, a topic that is in, er in his area of research and for which he has given expert testimony uh, to in, at the federal and state level. So he has a great deal of experience in this area. Dr. Asher, we're very much grateful for your willingness to give this talk and looking forward to what you have to say to us. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. And what was it? Bore but not insult? Bore us but don't insult. I can do that. I'm up to that challenge. <laughs> uh, after all, and I've used this in other settings, an economist is someone who wanted to be an accountant <laughs> but lacked the charisma. <laughs> So uh, I, I, can, I think I can do this. Um, so, um, well, thank you so much. And it's a real pleasure to be here. It's an honor to be here and, and to have uh, Paul with us as well. Um, so the topic is a mouthful. It's uh, losing the forest for the trees. That sounds OK. But it's on the loss of economic efficiency and equity in federal price fixing <laughs> class actions. So there's a lot of terms there. And so we'll, by the end, there's a blue book exam at the end, and I think you'll do fine on it. Uh, we'll define some terms and then uh, understand why this is important and, and what the detail is here. Um, so the broad overview is that the talk lies at the intersection of law uh, and economics, as well as statistics, or as economists would call it, econometrics, uh, and ethics. And the goal, if I'm successful, would be to convince you that the law has been perverted in the area of federal price fixing class actions 
and that one of the principal reasons for the change in the law uh, involves false claims by defense economic expert witnesses and defense counsel regarding a few things, not all of which will be understandable at this point, but will be subsequently. Uh, they include what is meant by common proof, uh, what econometrics can and cannot show, and cleverly confusing the concepts of impact and damages, and you will know what that means shortly. So here are the questions to consider. Uh, price fixing, what is it? What is price fixing? Uh, what are its effects? Uh, why is it unlawful? And how uh, are the laws against price fixing enforced? Uh, then there's the real battleground here is called class certification. It has to do with forming a class action of many injured parties. In order for the court case to go through as a class action, the court has to be satisfied that certain, uh, <coughs> certain characteristics um, uh, you know, have been met, and we'll explain what those are. This is entirely the battleground of these kinds of cases. Um, so what is class certification? Why is it so important? Um, and then what I'll talk about is here, it's, it's referred to as the plaintiff's approach uh, to in support of class certification. It really is the historical approach that plaintiff <coughs> economists and, and counsel have used, and I will reveal at this point that's the side I have been on. Uh, I'm not on a crusade, but I have felt good about being on the plaintiff side because usually these are cases where one of the defendant companies who's engaged in price fixing has run to the Justice Department's uh, leniency program and said, we did it, we'll cooperate, and so forth. And so I generally know I'm on the right side of the case as on the plaintiff side, the ones bringing suit against the price fixers. So what must plaintiffs demonstrate in order to go forward as a class of injured parties? What is the appropriate way to do so? And then we'll talk about the other side, the defendant's approach in opposition to class certification. And they have been making strides in, I would say, confusing the court and successfully defeating class certifications that formerly would be, uh, would be granted. And so how have Ir uh, irrelevant details and false claims from econometrics cause some courts to lose the force for the trees, which is where the title comes from. Time permitting, I'm not sure there will be uh, some judicial and policy <coughs> options. If I don't get there, the principal option I'm talking about is restoring the historical <laughs> approach. So you'll know what that is in case I run out of time. Uh, how can we, rest and so it's how can we restore procedures for deterring, for stopping, price fixing. So a tall order, so as they say, fasten your seatbelts. So here we go. Uh, we're going to talk about price fixing. What is it? Well, it's when companies, instead of competing with one another, get together and cooperate to raise prices. They form what's <coughs> called a cartel. And what's the, uh, and, and essentially what they're doing, and students who have taken microeconomics can, uh, can say this, is what they're going to do is jointly act as if they're a monopolist. And we know what monopolists do is they restrain output and jack up prices from what they would be in a more competitive market. So they're purposely diminishing competition in order to bring about that result. So that is the effect, is it, it causes price, it causes the prices to be higher than they otherwise would be. Now, in some cases, that means they're actually higher. So one of my cases is called EPDM. You'll see this on a subsequent list. It's, it's a, it's a, <clears throat> uh, synthetic rubber that's put on flat roofs, uh, and it's also used in cars to make hoses and trim around windows because it has unique heat properties, both cold and hot, that it's called crackless rubber. It doesn't crack with extreme temperatures. So the, the four or five producers in that, uh, in that industry got together, and they used price lists for all their products, and they decided to they agreed on raising the prices on their price lists. And that's what the case was about. <clears throat> Another one that I had called polypropylene carpet, which is the stuff where our feet are on at the moment, I suspect, um, what they did is they kept prices the same when they otherwise would have fallen. But it's still higher than they would have been absent the conspiracy. Another case on CRTs, cathode ray tubes, 
Some of the students may be too young to remember <laughs> deep <laughs> televisions and computer monitors. You know, if you watch old movies, you'll see them in, like, in press rooms. You know, these are deep monitors. Now we have flat panel screens, right? Um, and there, the price was falling because, in fact, the competition with flat panel screens like LCDs. And so what they did was slow the drop. So prices did fall. And some might say, how could there be price fixing if prices are falling? Well, because they were falling more slowly than they ought to have. So people still paid more <coughs> for them than they ought. So these are examples of what price fixing is. Um, so why is it unlawful? Well, the Sherman Act of 1890 uh, said that, and they call these, these kinds of behaviors restraints of trade. They declared them to be unlawful, that price fixing harms competition and causes economic injury to the purchasers. Uh, and this and other acts of Congress uh, basically established the rules for the competitive game what you can and can't do, and if you don't play by the rules, you'll be penalized. Now, how is that enforced? There are criminal cases brought by the antitrust division of the Justice Department, and these could result in criminal penalties, fines. Now, they go to the US Treasury. They don't go to the harmed parties. And it could include incarceration. That's less frequent. Um, there are civil cases, and that's the subject for this evening, there are sometimes follow-on cases that we already know there's an investigation or case going uh, at the criminal level, but this is now to recover damages. These are brought by the injured purchasers, and that's what the cases are for tonight. Um, in the literature, there were, the purchasers are referred to as private attorneys general. We don't have enough funds to fund the Justice Department to catch all this. You're going to see a list of the, the, the types of price fixing. It's, it's uh, uh, it's a huge list of industries that, that have experienced it. We can't get them all, so we allow purchasers to actually file suit to help enforce uh, the, the antitrust laws. So what they're suing for are monetary damages. According to the Sherman Act, they get treble damages, meaning triple, three times damages, except how these normally end is they get settled and are generally for less than one times damages, according to the work of John Connor at Purdue University. Um, DOJ, the Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission can also bring civil suits, not just criminal ones. <coughs> so some other examples. So some of you may have seen the movie, The Informant, starring Matt Damon as Mark Whitaker, and it, who was formerly of Archer Daniels Midland, who was one of the largest price fixing conspiracies in US history. There's the movie cover, maybe you can't see over there, but that's Matt Damon. Um, that's Mark Whitaker. And I say, at, if at the end time permits, ask me about him. I actually introduced him at, uh, at Wharton at a, at a function sponsored by the Wharton Christian Fellowship. He subsequently came to faith and uh, is remorseful about his behavior. Um, the industries in which I have testified as an expert witness include the following. Commercial solid waste collection and disposal. Garbage. This is against the main two. It was Browning Ferris and waste management. Uh, residential doors. Something called rendering. I'm not even going to tell you. It's gross. Uh, <laughs> commercial paper. So in our bathrooms, uh, we have you know paper towels and seat liners and, and toilet paper. That, that was price fixed. Um, polypropylene carpet. I mentioned. So that's the stuff where our feet are on. Ethylene propylene diene monomer. That's the EPDM. That's the crackless rubber. Sulfuric acid. Fashion modeling in New York. That was kind of fun. Uh, abrasive grains cast iron soil pipe and cathode ray tubes. And I'm just a little player. This is a small, small sample of the kinds of cases. There was an article uh, by Levenstein and Suslow that <coughs> identify industries that are, I call, recidivist price fixers. That again and again and again, even though they've been caught before, they do it again. And so I'm not going to prolong the slide, but it gives you an idea. This is across lots of industries, and some seem to be prone to revisiting that behavior. So that's price fixing, quick overview. What is class certification? It is the battleground. Well, in the price fixing context, there are typically many injured parties. By the way, my cases are typically not consumer cases. They're usually businesses get together to fix prices of kind of raw materials or intermediate materials that they sell to other businesses who use it as inputs to what they make and so forth. And it goes down to what we call the supply chain. But there are still many businesses that buy this, could be thousands. 
Um, so many injured parties, their large aggregate damages, aggregate just means in the sum, in total, let me sum across all of them, large aggregate damages, the cases are now usually in the hundreds of millions of dollars before traveling, so they could be over a billion. Um, but there are potentially, though, small individual damages for each party. For them, it might be hundreds, might be thousands, could be tens of thousands, but that's small in comparison to bringing suit. None of these individual parties have an incentive to file suit because it's not worth it. It costs millions to prosecute one of these cases. So colorfully, there's a, a famous judge, he recent, just recently retired, Richard Posner, former law professor at University of Chicago Law School, and was on the bench in the Seventh Circuit for many years. Uh, colorful lang uh, language in lots of cases, this being one. He said, the realistic alternative to a class action is not 17 million individual suits, but zero individual suits, as only a lunatic or a fanatic sues for $30. Right, that's the point, is if the class is not certified, the case is over. Right? That's how important this is, okay? So, the result then is without a class <coughs> action vehicle, then the perpetrators get to retain their ill-gotten gains, their cartel profits. So, uh, this, I won't quote it, but the, this is even recognized by some defense experts who I will talk about later. They recognize this. In fact, that's why they try to stop these cases at the class certification stage, because then they're done. So, uh, what's the purpose? It's mostly to deter, because when we, if we don't, then we have this more monopolist kind of setting, which is, the economic students will know, is inefficient. It's, it's Again, prices are higher than they ought to be, and quantities are lower than they ought to be. Um, so the, the main goal, and we'll see why, uh, is deterrence. Now, there could be some other goals. It could be just to repay the people who, spent, who paid too much. That would be compensation. So that would we call equity or fairness. It could be a, a goal. And also just judicial efficiency. All these different people were <coughs> harmed by the same conduct rather than have all separate suits who have to prove the same things, why not do this in one case? So there would be judicial efficiency. Um, Posner, again, along with another uh, famous academic, Landis, said that achievement of the goals of antitrust laws require that deterrence be preferred. Now, of course, if it's successful at deterring, then things are fair too, right? No one's injured. Um, but deterrence is the main goal. And the, that has been tr found to be true even in court cases. So this, this turned out to be important. It seems like a digression, but it's really important that way back there was a case called Hanover Shoe and a companion case called Illinois Brick. And the defendants argued that the direct purchasers who bought the price fix product were not injured. Why? Because they passed on those higher prices to their customers. <coughs> so it was, con it was called the passing on defense. So they said, look, you weren't even injured, so you don't have standing to sue. In fact, it's, it would be so hard to figure out how much the next group was injured and it gets, gets passed down the supply chain that we ought to, you just ought to throw this thing out and let us keep our cartel profits. And the court was, of course, so offended by this, they made a ruling and they said, no, the direct purchasers get to sue, even if they passed it on, because it's not now about Com compensation, it's about making sure perpetrators pay. It's all about deterrence, okay? So, uh, Illinois Brick is the one that's usually cited. That just kind of was the final punctuation. We knew from Hanover <coughs> Shoe, it, direct purchasers <coughs> could sue. Illinois Brick said, yeah, and only direct purchasers. It's not like all the others could too, right? In federal district court. I'm not gonna go into it in state courts sometimes further down the chain, those harm parties can seek redress in state courts. So, um, so in order for a case to proceed as a class action, all together, all these harm parties, the court has to make sure that certain provisions are satisfied, and it's called Rule 23. And there's two parts, A and B, and I'll put them up. We're not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but Part A is not as contentious as the Part B. Part A just says, well, there's gotta be a lot of these injured people, they call this provision numerosity. And then there have to be questions that are common to all of the people that would like to be in the class, what they call the putative 
class members, right? It's not a class yet, so they're not class members, but they're hoping to be, so they're going to call them putative class members. They have to be common issues. They're going to be represented, like maybe one or two or three or four of the harm parties are going to serve as the class representatives, and they represent all the other harmed parties who are, as they say, similarly situated. So the claims of the representatives need to be typical of the claims of the rest of the class. And then finally, adequacy, that's really saying counsel needs to be adequate. They need to be experienced and know what they're doing, and they always are on both sides. The, all the arguments about 23B3, it's about predominance. And it's, and it's, I'm just gonna read parts of it, but it says the court finds that questions of law or fact common to the class members predominate over any questions affecting only individual members. And that uh, as a class action is superior to other available methods for fairly and efficiently adjudicating the controversy. So it's not that individual issues can't be present, it's just that the common ones need to predominate over the individual ones. This turns out to be, you know, so park this, this turns out to be where the battle and, and where the sort of clever tactics have, have come in. We're not, we don't need to know the rest of the provisions. So we got price fixing and class certification. Now, what's the historical approach or what I call the plaintiff's approach in supporting a motion for class certification? Um, so what is it that the plaintiffs need to demonstrate? Well, what we just read, that, that uh, there's predominance. Um, and, and that the following things can be addressed at trial using what they call common proof evidence common to the class. One, of course, is the existence of a violation. So we have to prove they actually got together and conspired to raise prices. Well, that certainly is common because if, you're all, if we're all the class, or putative class members, we each have a, an incentive to show that they got, you know, they got together and agreed on prices. So that, there's nothing about us individually that matters. That's common to all of us. So that one is not even disputed by, uh, <clears throat> by the defendants. The fight is over the next two, something called common impact, which is they, the court calls injury in fact, just that there is some injury, <clears throat> irrespective of its amount. So they call fact of damage or injury in fact, that there's just some injury, and that there's a method that can be used to compute the aggregate, again, the total sum of damages across the class. So that's what the plaintiffs need to show. And that, this is where the economists come in. The first one is generally the attorneys. Um, so uh, on impact, what we get to assume at the class certification stage is that the allegations in the complaint are true, meaning there was a price fixing conspiracy. Now, the plaintiffs are gonna have to prove that down the road at trial. The whole issue right now is, are we gonna get to trial? Is there gonna be a case? Is this gonna go forward as a class? So we get to assume they did the deed, but what we can't assume is that the effects of it are class-wide. We have to demonstrate that they would be class-wide. And then we have to figure out even what that means. So historically, the plaintiff economic expert uses what we call case-specific facts and economic theory to demonstrate that it would be very difficult for any sizable number, maybe any of these plaintiffs, any of these purchasers, to have escaped every price increase over the period of the conspiracy, every price increase on every product purchase over that time. If they bought even once at an elevated price because it's elevated due to the conspiracy, they've been impacted, affected, All right? So, because remember, that doesn't matter about how much. So, to say that there would be some sizable number uninjured, you would actually be saying that some large number never bought at any time a product that had an elevated price over, it could be a five-year conspiracy, a 15-year conspiracy, which is fairly heroic, given the case-specific facts and the theory that we're gonna cover. Now, in damages, they generally need to demonstrate that there are econometric, which is statistical, uh, or other methods that exist that can reasonably compute aggregate damages and show that they are what we call statistically significant. I might defer some of the questions on that to the math professors we have in the room who teach this subject, but uh, this is at the heart of these, uh, uh, these disputes. Um, <coughs> yeah. 
So, impact, some injury, irrespective of amount. So there's an economist who has also testified in this area and wrote an article that summarized what a lot of economic expert witnesses, like me, have done over the years and was agreed with by the courts. All those cases, by the way, that I listed, where I, at least the ones where I was on uh, class certification, they were all certified. But things are not that way anymore. It's getting harder to get these certified. More are being denied. So he, just, so he wrote up what it is uh, that is the historical approach. And so he asked these questions. Is there a plausible economic theory and corroborating evidence, so that was the facts with the theory, that links the challenged conduct, the price fixing, to anti-competitive effects generally, to increase prices generally? And second, is the second step, is there some mechanism that would reliably transmit these anti-competitive effects, you know, the overcharge, to all or a large share of the proposed class. So that's what we need to deal with. That's, that's the assignment on the plaintiff's side. If they can't convince the court, then it doesn't go forward. So what's the typical showing? What, what is it that, that economists do? Well, it's the following. These are the kind of set of case-specific facts of the industry and conduct of the firms that are relevant. There's a, lar there's a large market share possessed by the conspiring firms, so EPDM. The, the firms uh, had 90% of the market. So there's not much option to buy this stuff anywhere else. And they probably, they may not, the others may not even know there's a conspiracy. They generally just follow the price increase. It's good for them. They're not big enough to steal like the market from them by undercutting them. They're, they're small players. So large market share gives them what we call in economics courses, market power. The class products, the price fixed products are what we call fungible or substitutable sometimes referred to as commodity products. We use fancy phrases for simple things. They're identical. They're homogeneous is what we say in economics courses. EPDM is EPDM is EPDM. <coughs> Whoever makes it, it's the same. In fact, in that case, so much the same that when one of the companies, actually maybe two of the companies, had problems with disrupted production, other companies, competitors, manufacturer, put it in the other company's bags for them and <coughs> delivered them. Right. It's the same stuff. So if it's the same stuff, they, they're not differentiated. They only compete on price. Oh, except they're conspiring on price. They're not competing on price. The non-existence of closely substitutable non-class products. So again, using EPDM, if they raise the price, it's like, well, and I make hoses for cars, what am I going to turn to? There's nothing else. While EPDM is EPDM is EPDM across all those who make it, there is no other product that I can use in place of EPDM that has the same heat characteristics, crackless rubber. So sometimes it's said that my demand, you know, the demand is inelastic, price insensitive. The price goes up, I just gotta pay it because that's what I make and it requires that input. Barriers to entry, it's not easy for other companies to jump in, therefore it says ensuring the inability to substitute the same products from a new firm not participating in the conspiracy. So if you've got these together, as I put taken together, the characteristics imply it would be extremely difficult for customers to avoid price increases in a market which competition is purposely diminished. So it's a logical conclusion based on facts in the industry along with economic theory. That it would, again, they would have to, to not be impacted, they would have had to escape every price increase over the period. So the second step in uh, Singer's two-step uh, approach is to demonstrate that he calls it that the class is cohesive and that what he means by that is that essentially um, the challenge conduct adversely impacted a large share or even all or nearly all of, the, of its members. And he says it's easier to demonstrate this notion of cohesiveness uh, where defendants use list prices. They put all the prices on a piece of paper usually. And, this, and it's a, like a matrix. And these, <coughs> these products and those products. Or all buyers pay the list price, or excuse me, and all pro, uh, buyers pay list prices or some discount off of list price. Now the, the discounts could be different for different, maybe it's a big purchaser gets a bigger discount. And maybe a further 
one away has it's a smaller discount because there's transportation more transportation costs you could see there in the end there could be a very a variation in prices but this is what we're we're getting at here is that, that oh by the way buyers are atomistic fancy word for we're, we're not getting together to, to bargain against the price fixers they just come to me and they come separately to you and so on so we don't really have any power to to fight back uh, as it were um, so Here's what Singer says about list prices. He goes, indeed, in the US economy, it is common for firms to charge customers list prices accompanied by private discounts. Assuming the individual discounts from the common base price are not affected by the challenge conduct from the price fixing, inflation of this common element, the base price, should harm all customers. Right. So um, the court says the same thing. Singer actually uh, cites the EPDM case, and that's one of my cases. And this is the decision, so I'm going to, I'll read parts of it. Um, uh, this is by the judge in that case. He goes, the plaintiffs have met their burden for demonstrating that the element of injury in fact, impact, some injury, can be proven by evidence common to the class. The six national price lists that ostensibly apply to every customer in conjunction with the general analysis of the characteristics of the EPDM market, right? Large market share, barriers to entry, and so forth, so that support the notion that the price list increases had class-wide impact. <clears throat> right? And then in that decision, this is pretty typical in these decisions, then he quotes other court decisions to support it, citing precedent, as it were. He said, neither a variety of prices nor negotiated prices is an impediment to class certification if it appears the plaintiffs may be able to prove at trial that the price range was affected generally. So again, we could have different prices, different discounts off a list, except when we raise the base price, they're all higher. Yeah, they're still gonna be different, but they're higher than they would have otherwise be. Would, would have been. And then I won't read all this, but uh, yet one more case, finally down at the bottom, it says, accordingly, the fact of damage or impact is predominantly, if not entirely, a common question. So the court has ruled this way, um, but it's gotten confused in recent years. <clears throat> so now, besides impact, we said they have to do damages. They have to, we have to find a way to compute the aggregate overcharge. Now, how do we do that? by the use of statistics. We get data on all the purchases and what their prices were and quantities, all kinds of things. And so we estimate a statistical equation. Yow, that hurts. Um, so you don't have to look at it, and I'm not gonna put up the rest because it, it would be even scarier. So let's just talk. <laughs> uh, prices go up and down for all kinds of reasons. What would happen if other, if other things being equal, as we say, the demand for the product went up? What would you figure would happen to the price of the product? If the demand goes up for the product, all the price goes up, yeah, right? Because like you know, the band got really they won a Grammy, right? So now people go and oh, now the seats at the concert are going to be more expensive, right? So it goes up, right? So now if the price goes up, we can say oh, the price went up, it must be price fixing. No, no, they can go up for quite legitimate reasons. We have to then separate the legitimate reasons and the conspiratorial ones, and that's what statistics or econometrics allows you to do, to ascribe to each of the various factors its contribution to the thing you're explaining. On the left is a P, that's price. D, we just did, it's some demand factors. I'm not gonna go into more detail, but these are things that legitimately affect price. They need to be controlled for. What about if the cost of making the stuff went up? The, the raw material prices went up, or wages went up, electricity costs went up. What would happen to the price? It goes up. So we got to control for that. What we have to figure out, oh, and there can be individual, that's the S, supply factors. The X is some individual things. Again, maybe it's big customers, they get bigger discounts, things that lead to variation prices across the class members. So for you statistical folks, it could be a full-blown fixed effects model. But we're just saying there's some individual things we might control for. And then the key is C, the conspiracy variable. All that, it's a very simple variable. It's just, it just takes on the value of zero in years when there was no conspiracy and one in years where it was a, there was a conspiracy. We call it an indicator variable or a dummy 
variable. The coefficient on the front of that is what tells us whether after controlling for all the other stuff that could lead to legitimate changes and variations in price, is there an explanation beyond that owing to you know, something special about this period of time that prices are higher? And if that coefficient is in here, lambda, is positive and statistically significant, then that supports the plaintiff's view that after controlling for supply and demand conditions, uh, there appears to be uh, a bump due to, the com due to the conspiracy. So this is where uh, the fight has taken place as well. So I won't put all this stuff up. We just talked about it. Now, I'm also not going to talk about this. I just put it up because I'm t totally pandering. This is from an article by two of the biggest names in the profession. They're economists who are at law schools, uh, uh, Jonathan Baker and Dan Rubenfeld. And they, they wrote an article a while back, and uh, it's called uh, Empirical Methods in Antitrust Litigation. And they, they talked about these statistical methods in various areas of antitrust uh, enforcement. The first was price fixing and, in fact, class certification, and they happened to write about my work in the polypropylene carpet case. I remember being called by one of them, and I, I thought he was going to trash me, so uh, I gave him the name of the attorney, he can get some information, uh, but uh, I, I found out later, I ran into Dan Rubenfeld, he goes, oh no, it was actually uh, quite confirming of what you did, it sort of made my year, made my last 10 years. Uh, <laughs> and so I'm not going to read all of them, just two really short ones, I put the rest up there just to just to look important. Um, but it, all, it says, although the court opinion does not spell out all the details of Professor Asher's proposed regression model, it couldn't. It was, a lot of it was filed under seal. It was confidential, so they couldn't reveal everything. But based on what they could reveal, it said, it appears similar to price equations commonly used to measure damages in litigation settings, like the one we just passed by. Right? That's what it was. It was an equation just like that. And then later, he goes, the court accepted that Professor Asher's proposed methodology would, and this, these are quotes from the decision, follow valid econometric principles, would possess probative value, it would be useful, uh, and of particular importance for class certification, would primarily use common evidence. So we've now pretty much uh, done it. We know what price fixing is. We know we have to get a class for this to go forward. In order to have a class, we need to satisfy issues of common evidence to demonstrate impact and damages. So, so what do the defendants do? Where, how, how have we been led into the trees? So here we go. We're going into the trees. I hope to bring you back out at the end. <clears throat> and this is only slightly cynical, I put up there. So what do the defendants typically do? They say, well, actually, you know, or the economists on their behalf, well, they didn't do it. But if they did, there were no damages. But if there were, they were small. I'm being slightly cynical, but actually I did have a case where this was done. Um, and furthermore, this is the most complicated in industry on the planet, and everything is individualized, individualized, individualized. They will use that word in as many times as possible in the economic reports and the legal briefs, right? Because they're going after 23B3. They want to show that, per, that common things don't predominate over all the individualized things. So everything is individualized, and it's just chaos, and there's no hope, and the price fixers ought to just keep their cartel profits. So plaintiff experts model, like one might like by me, is fatally flawed, they like to say. Uh, it will require thousands of mini-trials uh, to handle individualized issues. Um, and, uh, you know, there's negotiations, there's discounts, all kinds of things I won't go into. Uh, and the key plaintiff's overcharge coefficient, lambda, is an average and cannot be used to conclude that all or nearly all putative class members have been affected. Some, maybe many, are or could be uninjured. Now they're right. Lambda is an average. Some were damaged less and some are damaged more. It, it gets the average overcharge, and we'll talk about this in a little bit. But remember, we don't use that from the plaintiff side as, support, as supporting impact. That's, we use it to calculate aggregate damages. Impact were the facts and the theory that it would have been hard for anybody to escape a price increase. So they're basically, they're shifting things and saying we actually have to use it and it can't work. So setting up a straw man and knocking it down. It's pretty complicated. So, um, so the key attacks, they, what they'll say is there is disparate impact. This is a very clever term, so I'll come back to this. 
and that, um, that they can use statistical <laughs> procedures, basically the ones that we've already talked about, to demonstrate which of the class <clears throat> members are actually not injured. That turns out to be untrue. Uh, there are too many uninjured uh, parties to warrant class treatment and the, all the varying degrees of, of harm or of injury means that the class action vehicle is not an appropriate mechanism to carry out justice. They even come up with something, one, one set of authors came up with the common proof paradox. This is a logical construct that's rather self-serving. You can't use aggregate data to, to, to get at individual harm. But you can't even use individual data in their view because that would be in defiance of using a class action vehicles. So you could never have a class certified. It, it's an ex ante beforehand bias against ever certifying a class. And they say so later. This is why, and they know it would be the, the end of the case. So that's why they, they do this. In reality, um, I said this is clever because really what they're talking about is not impact. They're talking about damages. Right? They're talking about varying, imp you know, disparate impact, varying effects. That's damages, that's not impact. Right? So it's a very clever pivot here in using terminology to try to get the courts to throw these things out. Uh, and it turns out that uh, it is, as I put here, it is permissible, in fact, expected that damages will vary. This is not an impediment to class certification. And I'll quote Posner on that momentarily. Um, and furthermore, the statistical methods that they claim they can use to identify uninjured parties is just incorrect, and at least in the way that the court defines injury. I'm just going to skip. I just don't have the heart to drag you through what they say, um, and I need to pick up some time. Um, but again, don't miss the purpose, which is they're not saying yeah, this is all individualized, so a superior method, if you remember back to 23b3, is an individualized approach. No, they're not proposing one. They just want to defeat the class certification and end the case. <coughs> um, so um, I'm going to skip their other arguments and, and say now we are, we're, <coughs> deep in, we're deep in the trees. So what are the logical pivots? So again, common impact has been switched from impact, which is just some injury, to really damages, which is the amount <coughs> of injury, again, which is both permitted and expected to vary. So the defendants I put here have cleverly switched from saying commonality is some injury, that it's widespread, to the need to demonstrate that the amount of, in of injury has to be common. Clever, right? And of course, it won't be. I mean, that would be a miracle <coughs> if it were. Um, so that's not the law. But because it gets tied up with econometrics, which judges don't understand, they sometimes don't realize what's going on here. So Judge Richard Posner, again, said, it would drive a stake through the heart of the class action device to require that every member of the class have identical damages. If the issues of liability are genuinely common issues and the damages of individual class members can be readily determined in individual hearings, in settlement negotiations or by creation of subclasses, the fact that damages are not identical across all class members should not preclude class certification. Otherwise, defendants would be able to escape liability for tortious harms of enormous aggregate magnitude, but so widely distributed as not to be remediable in individual suits. So he gets it. Not everybody does. There are some courts that don't get this. So now the other is common impact has switched from injury in fact to lots of injury in fact, I like to call it. So um, what they're saying, so I'll try to speed this up. They're saying what we need to do is take that regression, that explanation of prices that we use in the aggregate to come up with <coughs> aggregate damages, but use it separately on your purchases, on your purchases, on yours and yours and yours and yours, where all the harm people. Now, besides some statistical issues of what some people call slicing and dicing, you're, you're, you're shrinking your sample sizes, which will probably mean you'll dismiss some as being injured when they truly are. Um, it's, it's even a more serious point than that is it's just wrong because what they're testing is whether you've had a lot of harm. Remember what impact is. You just have to have been harmed some, irrespective of amount. 
So you could buy again just once in the whole time period. You are impacted. Maybe not enough to get a check at the end of this whole thing, but you are impacted. But they're going to take that regression and run it just on your purchases. So each of us are going to have a different lambda. And for some of them, it's going to be positive and big. Some of it's going to be you know, smaller. But remember, it has to be statistically significant. If it's not, then statisticians would say, well, we can't dismiss the fact that it could be zero. Except this isn't consistent with the law. That's the way we, we treat a lot of relationships. But remember, what it's testing, let's go back to, to the point where you bought one time. You run the equation on your, <coughs> your purchases. It's going to be insignificant. You buy some more, it's still going to be insignificant. You buy some more, it's still going to be insignificant. You'd have to buy so much price-fixed product that it finally tips the significance from insignificant to significant. That's not the law. It doesn't say you need to buy, to be injured, you need to buy a certain amount of, of the price fixed product so that T statistic reaches two. I mean, that's not what the law says. You just have to be injured some. But again, judges don't understand econometrics and realize when big name economists say it was insignificant, they were not injured. They declared them to be not injured. They believe it, and it's not true. I couldn't say that and then look myself in the mirror, frankly. That's the ethical part of this. So I'm going to, one, one last example uh, is, let's suppose half of the room bought only one time. And so you basically zero damages, but you, 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 you're impacted. The other bought the whole time 20% bump because of the conspiracy. You're harmed, 20% you're harmed, effectively zero. If I run that equation over all of you, lambda is 10%. But that's the right number. 10% of the whole is the same as 20% of the half. Right? And there's, so there's no, and one, art, one author has said this, there's no injustice to the defendants by including not very harmed or not harmed people in the, in the class. It doesn't affect the aggregate number. Judges don't know that. They feel, oh no, you're gonna include some unharmed people. That's gonna make the defendants pay more than they ought. No, no, it doesn't change what they ought to pay, right? Now, the other argument is, yeah, but then it kind of assumes this. If we pay everybody 10%, then you get 10% when you should have gotten nothing. That's not right. Of course, you're getting paid 10 when you should have gotten 20. So the, the argument against the situation actually reduces to the argument that it is so unfair for you to be getting money that you don't deserve and well and you to get less than you should, even though the number is right for them to pay, it's less fair to do that than just for us to keep the cartel profits. <laughs> this, took, this, is, this, this is hard to get across. Hopefully I've bored you, but you know, not insulted you. But uh, that's really what's going on. And let me just see. If, um, so that's this, this example. Um, yeah. So. Uh, I would, if, as long as this article gets published and judges read it, I would be satisfied if they, if they would restore what was the historic approach uh, and that they, they sort of get what they, they, they haven't gotten. Um, there are some other approaches. Uh, I think I'll spare you, but I wrote on the last slide essentially what we, what we learned about what plaintiffs do and what defendants do to confuse the situation. And then I say this in the end, but defendants' argument reduces to the belief that it is so unfair for some purchasers to be undercompensated and some overcompensated, even if the aggregate amount of damages is correct, that the perpetrators ought to escape liability for their conduct. And my conclusion is this is a perversion of antitrust law. So, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Asher. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm going to introduce the two respondents, um, and they'll come up afterwards and follow without interruption. So the first is Dr. Ed Song. He grew up in central Virginia and has degrees from Yale, a bachelor's, Oxford, a master's, and the University of Virginia, a PhD. 
He specializes in moral and political philosophy, practical ethics, and philosophy of religion. Before arriving at Westmont, he was an associate professor of philosophy at Louisiana State University. Ed is married to Felicia Song, who teaches in the sociology department at Westmont. They have two children. He's an avid runner, cyclist, and cook. His favorite color is blue. He thinks the zone read will work in the NFL, and he wonders why everyone in the world isn't an Anglican. <laughs> I actually worship at a free Methodist church. Since, you know, since I wrote that. Book. Great. <laughs> and then our second respondent is uh, Ed Knoll, and this time it's Ed with two D's. Uh, Dr. Knoll earned a doctorate in economics at Louisiana State University, an MBA at the University of Texas, Austin, and a bachelor's degree from Texas Tech University. He specializes in the history of economic thought, financial markets, and Christianity in economics. He's authored two books, the most recent of which titled Economic Growth, Unleashing the Potential of Human Flourishing. Dr. Knoll has co-directed the Westmont and Europe semester and international economics and business programs in Asia and Europe. He also serves as vice president of the Association of Christian Economists. Uh, whichever one of you is first, go ahead and come up. Thank you. Somehow the Association of Christian Economists found their way to elect me president recently. I don't know, that probably was an error on their part, but um, nonetheless, um, thank you, Professor Asher, for um, your presentation, and thanks for everyone for joining us on, uh, this evening. Um, Professor Asher's analyzed why uh, motions for class certification and price fixing classes have been, uh, cases have been denied, and offered some proposed remedies to maintain efficiency in antitrust enforcement. You know, in uh, thinking about this paper, um, reflecting on uh, what the work we do as economists, I suppose economists such as Dr. Asher and myself, I'd include uh, Enrico here as well, um, may strike a lot of people as odd fellows. We speak about an invisible hand that guides markets to social benefits and prisoners' dilemmas, what's that about, that goes in the opposite direction. And perhaps we seem strange because if you cut us, we will bleed competition. Yes, as economists, we both favor the antitrust deterrence of price fixing among firms. Yet, what ends do antitrust, does antitrust policy um, serve? What should be the goal in deterring anti-competitive conduct? Should it be a welfare standard that evaluates the effect on all participants, including the firms involved, plaintiffs, and defendants? This is advocated often by economists. Or should the standard be consumer welfare alone? That should be our focus. That's the standard most commonly used by regulators and courts. Professor Asher's presentation leaves us with some questions uh, in this regard, and in fact, some others that I want to raise here. First, I want to consider the narrative he provides regarding the historical approach to applying Rule 23. What else might lie behind the court's rulings regarding class certification? And initially, I will note that there are about 10 private antitrust suits for every public one. And uh, the sort of list there of uh, all the cases there reflects the um, role uh, provided in the Sherman Act for private parties to act as, as the Professor Asher noted, private attorneys general. And that proliferates. Um, private firms as plaintiffs are bringing suit against other private firms for alleged antitrust uh, violations. There's a lot of litigation here. My longtime friend, Ken Elzinga, who's professor of economics at the University of Virginia, um, and has testified in numerous antitrust cases, in fact, three at the Supreme Court. He's noted in footnote 35 of uh, Professor Asher's paper because he was on the um, plaintiff's, uh, oh, sorry, the defendant's side in the case he mentioned here. And by the way, Professor Elzinga has spoken at uh, Westmont, though not on price fixing, um, a great Christian economist. Um, but he observes regarding these private antitrust cases that for some time the courts engaged in very little significant economic analysis in determining class certification with respect to price fixing allegations. One side would argue that everyone in the class was essentially the same, no matter how much they bought, where they bought it, and even what they bought. 
while of course the defendant's side would swing the other way. This buyer was from a different income level. That buyer shopped elsewhere for the product, so how can they be the same? And the courts uh, uh, then uh, historically uh, often would uh, wind up adopting though class certification. And because class certification was often uh, granted, this meant that defendants who might believe they had a very good chance of winning a trial, maybe even greater than 50%, faced a class of plaintiffs that might number in the thousands, um, the, the, as the, and Professor Asher aptly described, all those folks that would have uh, been uh, uh, damaged. And um, the sum of that um, purported overcharge could be in the millions or hundreds of millions of dollars. Faced with the prospect of a form of a kind of bet the firm litigation, many defendants would settle not because they believed they violated the antitrust laws, but they simply could not afford to face the small probability of such a large judgment uh, against them. Now, uh, again, I, I would not uh, here um, uh, defend uh, many of the um, activities. Clearly, there are a number of firms that uh, do engage in price fixing, and Professor Asher's detailed that. But uh, we do sort of need to step back and ask about every particular case that's brought by a business through the private sector and the merits and um, validity of their charges there. Um, so what leads to the changes in the judicial approach to class certification? Settlements from these cases often were in the millions of dollars. And it's interesting that um, Professor Asher wrote, has written this uh, very thorough paper. It's um, 42 pages long, but um, I was really struck particularly about this, this discussion of the question of deterrence. And he mentions here, um, and quotes, makes this quote a couple of times in the paper, um, the following. To exemplify the principle of deterrence as equity, the authors of a well-known casebook in law and economics ask, within the context of property rights and nuis nuisance law, quote, if the damages were calculated, paid, and then dumped into the ocean, after taking out the attorney's fees, of course, <laughs> would the defendant still take the amount of his liability for damages into account in deciding how much to produce? Their intended answer is uh, yes, indicating that it's the payment by the perpetrator that matters, not the receipt of damages by the harmed parties that affect the behavior at issue. <clears throat> and so, you know, this question, would uh, it, uh, we get the same outcome if the um, funds were simply uh, a settlement dumped into the ocean. Um, the settlements, as I say, from these cases often were in the millions of dollars, most of which never made it their way to the consumers, and a lot of went, went to the um, plaintiff's, um, antitrust plaintiff's bar. Dr. Asher affirms that this is efficient for deterrence sake, even if the millions of dollars are dumped in the ocean. But are these funds truly dumped in the ocean? When much of the settlement goes to the plaintiff's bar, it incentivizes more cases, including some cases, it could be a, a small fraction, but some cases that might be weak. Litigation that would not be touched at all by the Department of Justice or the Federal Trade Commission are true two main arms of the federal government that pursue antitrust litigation. And of course, more settlements also bring in more money. Funds will go to plaintiffs, some of them downstream from the price fixer, uh, and you heard Professor Asher refer to that in, along the distribution chain of, of forwarding, in effect, price fixing. Consumers are not going to be directly receiving the compensation in damages. One could argue that judges and antitrust authorities at the Department of Justice recognized that this was making a bit of mockery of the deterrence antitrust is a uh, purpose to have by the Sherman Act. Hardcore price fixing cases uh, are pursued by the Department of Justice Private parties bring cases um, that the public authorities don't consider meritorious. And it's, there's no question, as Professor Asher alluded to, their budget is constrained. They have only a limited uh, uh, number of folks to bring these cases. Uh, how do they sort out? How do they determine uh, which case to bring at the, uh, for the, from the public standpoint? But the history, I think should ought to be said, the history of antitrust litigation is replete with instances where firms were getting outcompeted, pursued a, a, suit on, a private suit on their own, and they sought relief through private antitrust litigation. The Utah PAC case of uh, alleged price discrimination is one. I won't rehearse them all here for time's sake. Um, I would affirm that the higher quality of cases can likely be brought by the public antitrust agencies 
uh, higher quality than private parties, but that's another argument. That's a discussion for another uh, time, I suppose. But it would seem that this change in the way that they've been approaching the um, certification questions, relying on some economic substance, may have kept some weak antitrust cases from getting to the point where the settlement gold mine kicks in. Maybe there is some merit to this outcome. Um, I'm not going to say here that there's been no manipulation or distortion of ec econometric tests by defendants so as to lose judges in the trees of who in the class gets overpaid and who gets underpaid in the settlement. Uh, certainly that's not the case. Uh, there uh, have been, uh, and, and Professor Asher rightly documents and uh, illustrates this. His paper is quite helpful in demonstrating the evidence for this, and he provides a strong discussion of the problems with the defendant's empirical methodology. But in the end, Dr. Asher claims that efficiency and also equity is what should count when evaluating the direction of recent court decisions on class certification. <clears throat> As Christian economists, I wonder, should we overlook the equity of innocent parties having to cough up money in order to, to scare others from violation? Because there are uh, clearly some cases where uh, they make, uh, as, as we say, the type one error of uh, finding someone guilty when um, that's not the case. And that doesn't mean there aren't type two errors either, of course. I would propose uh, that cartel type activity is better deterred if sanctions on price fixers pushes them to internalize the harm imposed by such activity on consumers. Economists such as Gary Becker, jurists such as William Landis have shown that the most efficient deterrence penalty is the fine. A high fine goes straight to the treasury. There are no resources devoted to divvying up the settlement amount. We avoid various lit litigious, resource-consuming mechanisms of discovery, rejoinder, and so forth. Now, Professor Asher has a, a very uh, fascinating and I think helpful section in the final part of this paper that can get to on decoupling of damages. And I think that is a viable way forward. Uh, the idea that the damages um, could uh, go to um, the government, and um, I have a proposal for that. The paper mentions placing the damages into the Social Security Fund as a way to, quote, improve everyone's well-being. Now, I must say that's not a guarantee of equity, okay, to put it in Social Security. The majority of Social Security distri distributions are received by the middle class, not lower income Americans. That way of decoupling damages would not improve everyone's well-being as the author, he notes their uh, claims. Perhaps it would be best to earmark the funds from fines for the antitrust division of the Department of Justice that aims to serve social welfare by promoting competition. And I would suggest this would be a kind of hybrid approach where consumer well-being, along with the welfare of non-price-fixing competitors who have been harmed, downstream firms that have been harmed, would be served to some degree. It's clear we agree that all of us are served best through markets characterized by firms that independently compete. Surely it's appropriate to pursue the most effective means to deter collusion among firms. So again, our thanks to Dr. Asher for his careful scholarship on this question. Thank you. It's, it's interesting. Ed and I are getting at a slightly similar conclusion, albeit he's raising concerns about equity, and I'm going to be raising concerns about um, the effectiveness of these kinds of civil suits as, as deterrence. But anyways. But let me start by saying uh, that when I was invited to comment on, on Professor Asher's paper, I was pretty leery about my expertise and ability to con contribute in a meaningful way. I'm a moral and political philosopher by trade. I occasionally think about matters of philosophy of law, but never anything near the very specific and technical issues related to price fixing and class action lawsuits. And I'm also really interested in economics, but probably know just about enough about that stuff to do, my, to do harm to myself and others. But it's a testament to the clarity of, of Professor Asher's thinking and writing that now having read the paper, I actually feel pretty good about what I understand and found the paper to be uh, really stimulating. It's sometimes fun to jump into something that you know nothing about and try to think about it in kind of a wide-eyed, creative way. So that's what I'm going to try to do tonight. Being a philosopher, I'm going to shy away from the more technical economic stuff and focus on some of the issues that are a little more philosophical in nature. So I mainly want to talk about that idea of deterrence that's at the heart of the paper. 
I actually don't really have any problems with the arguments that Marty made in as much as I understand them. I think that's probably the right way to think about the conditions under which classes of people should be allowed to bring suits against companies. Um, but I am interested in knowing what Marty thinks about a more general problem regarding the ability of lawsuits that seek monetary awards to act as reliable deterrents to criminal behavior. I'm not sure that civil class action lawsuits of the kind that Marty dis discusses can ever reliably deter price fixing even when the legal considerations that guide such cases are arranged as he thinks they ought to be. Even when they're functioning at their very, very best, I think they do little to generate real deterrence. Uh, so let me start off just by saying, I'm, so I'm making this distinction that hopefully everybody understands between civil and criminal law. Criminal law deals with particularly serious wrongdoing. Um, so murder, theft, drunk driving all constitute criminal violations. Charges are brought by official government agencies and punishment can sometimes, at least sometimes, include imprisonment. In contrast, civil law regulates disputes between private parties. If I recklessly crash into your car doing harm to you, you can raise a civil suit against me for damages. My action isn't necessarily illegal. Maybe it is. Maybe there'll be criminal charges as well. But it might be such that you can sue for recompense in a civil case. Here, the penalty will likely be monetary, but will never include imprisonment. It's a civil case. So Professor Asher's paper deals with civil class action lawsuits. He mentions criminal cases, but primarily civil class action lawsuits. It concerns the ability for individual citizens who are harmed by illegal price fixing to band together into a single class of plaintiffs to sue those companies for damages. And uh, such class actions are necessary because the harms to any one individual might be very, very small, but their effects summed over all consumers in a market might be very big. Allowing individuals who have been harmed by price fixing to band together in a class gives them a meaningful mechanism to be compensated for their losses while also generating a penalty large enough to deter anyone who might think about such price fixing in the future. Professor Asher worries that judges adjudicating these cases have bought into bad econometric arguments, making it harder for them to come together as a class with the standing to sue. And so as a result, price fixing class actions rarely happen and so cannot create the deterrent effect that is an important part of this area of the law. Let's think a little bit more generally about the idea of deterrence. Consider a fanciful example. Take jaywalking. I will confess that at least when I'm out walking by myself, not with the kids, not with the wife, I'm a pretty serial jaywalker. I always look both ways and run across the street so that no car coming through the area has to slow down. I hate that. People who do that, that's a serious wrongdoing and they should go to jail. <laughs> but I don't do that. I run across the street. Um, and I do this with a fair amount of abandon. And I never worry about the legal penalties if I get caught. For one thing, I think the odds of getting caught are extremely low. And I'm pretty sure that whatever penalties associated with jaywalking are minor, so I don't let it bother me. Now, jaywalking isn't the most serious crime in the world, but suppose that the city of Santa Barbara was really, really worried about jaywalking. So they stationed snipers all over State Street, and the minute that you step off the curb to jaywalk, they shoot stun guns at you and swarm you so quickly that they have you cuffed before you hit the ground. Or suppose that they don't do that, but they impose mandatory 20-year prison sentences for anyone who was caught. Under either of those conditions, or both of them, you could be sure that I and no one would ever jaywalk. So what are the conditions under which legal penalties can serve as effective deterrence? Two things matter. The likelihood that you'll get caught and the severity of the penalty that you will receive. The higher the likelihood of getting caught, the lower the penalty can be. If you are 100% certain that you will be caught, the penalty need not be very high to deter behavior. I mean, high enough, but not spectacularly high. The lower the likelihood of getting caught, the higher the penalty needs to be. <laughs> if they impose the death penalty for jaywalking, no one would ever jaywalk. Even if they virtually never caught anyone, they only have to catch one. And then that will deter. There are some other considerations that matter. The more intentional and planned an action is, the more likely that it is to be responsive to deterrence 
Since it is easy enough for rational calculations of costs and benefits to figure into any kind of rationally planned action, penalties are less likely to deter acts of passion or impromptu snap decisions. And so price fixing is like this. It is paradigmatically intentional, rational, and planned. Cartels go to great lengths to accurately calculate whether specific efforts of price fixing will raise revenue. But I think it's pretty clear that it is very hard to strike the right kind of balance between the likelihood of getting caught and the severity of the mon monetary penalty for a class action civil suit uh, for such legal threats to serve as much of a deterrent for them. Consider the following example. Suppose my company enters into a cartel in which I am 99% certain that our efforts of price fixing will generate excess profits of $100 million. At the same time, I think that there's only a 10% chance that I will be caught, which might result in $300 million worth of penalties, triple penalties, but in all likelihood, very much less than that. If I'm 99% sure that I will make $100 million and only 10% sure that I will lose $300 million, then the rational thing for me to do is to form a cartel and illegally fix prices. The only way that this rational calculus could be changed is by imposing really gargantuan monetary penalties. If my odds of getting caught are only 10%, then the penalty would need to be almost a billion dollars. But this seems grossly out of step with the actual harm done. One could quibble with the estimated likelihood that a person would be caught and found guilty for price fixing. Maybe it's not 10%, maybe it's 20%, maybe it's even 30%. I'm pretty sure it's not 30%, but anyways. But this isn't going to make much of a difference with regard to how disproportionate the penalty needs to be in order for it to serve as a deterrent. The rational thing for me to do is to price fix and hire really smart attorneys and economists to come up with fancy, sophistic arguments to make it less likely that the class action suit ever happens. Civil cases with monetary awards are just a very weak tool to try to discourage this kind of behavior. So if deterrence is an important motivation, then I don't understand why criminal suits, where the penalty includes the possibility of imprisonment, I mean, usually fines, but, but maybe especially we should wave around the possibility of imprisonment. If that isn't a better idea and a, a better policy um, route than pursuing civil cases. The threat of criminal imprisonment is a very weighty consideration. So weighty, in fact, that it can deter even when the chance of getting caught is relatively low. Would you jaywalk if they were going to throw you in jail? I don't think so. It is also a very targeted penalty, so that only those that are directly involved in the actual conspiracy are punished for their behavior. Monetary policies are of any kind are blunt tools that can end up hurting persons that are uninvolved with the actual malfeasance. If a massive award is actually granted, the people who pay the price aren't just the people who committed the crime, but workers, stockholders, and community members who are completely innocent of any wrongdoing. None of this affects the specific arguments that Marty makes because we still need civil price fixing class actions to ensure that individuals who are harmed by price fixing are adequately compensated. We will want those cases to go forward as fairly as possible and to not be inhibited by bogus arguments. But I do think that such class action suits aren't the most powerful tools of deterrence and that if we care about discouraging such behavior, then we need to rely on more severe criminal penalties. Thanks. Okay, I'll invite Professor Asher to come up and offer a brief, um, brief remark or two by way of reacting to the two respondents. And then I'll rely on you to take questions from the floor. It is sort of a tradition that the first question come from a student. And I have every confidence that our students here will be able to come up with one, however poignant the pause might be. Okay. So respond and then take a question first from a student and then from the general audience. All right, thank you. Thank you for your comments, both of you. I appreciate them a lot. So I will respond to a few of them um, briefly. Uh, 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 Ed Knoll's comments seem to suggest that uh, <clears throat> there might be frivolous suits. And that we, see, we hear about these in some areas of the law, tort law, for example. Uh, I don't think these happen very frequently in antitrust. It costs so much to prosecute one of these cases and the attorneys actually put up the money themselves. So they're betting that this is a good case that I haven't seen one come to me that was, was anything shy of, of a solid case. 
and the and a lot of these the Justice Department either was pursuing and also found them guilty, or just didn't have the resources to to get to that point. So the fact that <clears throat> oh by the way there are also sanctions against attorneys who bring frivolous suits. So just to say that there are frivolous suits and that uh, this might incentivize the fact that some of the money goes to a t plaintiff attorneys, uh, that may not be you know, sufficient to say that this is the wrong thing. In fact, some will argue there aren't enough of these cases. If only 30% are found out, then more of these ought to be prosecuted. We, we ought to be providing more incentives for these cases. Now, yeah, some of them are bet the firm cases. Most of these, though, Somebody's already come to the leniency program and said, yes, we did it, and we'll cooperate, and they do, and they provide documents and so forth. So it does happen probably more than we know, and, I, and, I, and, it, and so one argument <clears throat> between the two of you is maybe the incentives aren't strong enough, actually. As far as uh, the dumped into the ocean thing, uh, this is one of the most well-received notions in law and economics. So there's an area in torts called the collateral source rule. Um, if you get <clears throat> if you get hit by this is an example if you get hit by a car, your car gets damaged. You collect from your insurance company, let's say. Now, can you sue the negligent driver who hit you? And and now these days things are a little bit different. But back when this hadn't yet changed, the answer was yeah, actually you could. And one judge even dissented. That's not right because that's a double dip for you. But again, it's not about compensation at this point. It's about deterrence. So they allowed, it's called the collateral source rule. As long as the second source is a collateral source, not related to the first, like it's from an insurance company, you can do that. Why? Because we want to make sure that perpetrators, negligent drivers, have an incentive not to behave that way. So that, and there are others. And, and that is the logic behind Illinois BRIC. And that wasn't me. I mean, that was the court itself saying that, that it should do that. And by the way, <clears throat> where the money goes should not matter to the defendant, right? If, if, if costs go up, then I might, right, price, this is what we teach in economics, prices send signals. If prices go up, ooh, I might need to cut back on that, right? right? I respond. Um, but in some cases I need it, so I go ahead and I pay it. Now, am I going to pay it or not pay it depending on what the company does with it? No, it's just an incentive. It affects my costs, and I'm going to make the best decision for me. So that's what these authors, these well-known law professors said. You, they were being, of course, a little bit cavalier, like if you just dump it in the ocean. In fact, I will sometimes joke in the same way, like, well, that's probably what giving it to plaintiff attorneys is. It's like dumping it in the ocean. Uh -huh. But as long as the perpetrators face that penalty, then they should have some incentive. Now, flipping over to Ed is maybe it's not sufficient incentive. Now, part of that's because the, the whole process is being eroded by what's going on. So that's why I spoke about it. And some of these, you know, there's some larger issues here which just were beyond the scope of the paper, but I'm sympathetic, in fact, about what is the right standard for efficiency. Um, we're just, I'm just trying to remedy a problem that's, that's gone haywire. But I've actually joked also about, uh, I think, that, that the incentives to not do this, the deterrence incentive, would be would be stronger if we made it so the defendants couldn't play golf. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we ran into each other, and I said, yeah, and he asked just about this a little bit, and I said, yeah. No, I would agree. The problem is we don't fund the Justice Department anywhere close enough. That's why it's 10 to 1, civil versus criminal. We, we don't give them the resources with which to do this. And uh, so that's why we need private attorneys general. And I don't think it leads to frivolous cases if that were True, there would be many more sanctions imposed by the courts. Uh, I think that's, there's so much more. Um, one last thing, in terms of where it, it goes, now, again, does it go to Social Security? Does it go to the Treasury? Well, apparently it shouldn't matter where it goes as long as they have to pay it. Now, if we're thinking about equity, yeah, then maybe we want to be clearer on where it goes. And, and even in, like, um, punitive damage suits where they're saying, well, you, there's a certain amount of compensatory damage to compensate for the harm, but then they might throw on, because it's egregious, some punitive damages. There has been arguments, have been arguments in that area as well to decouple some of that money from the, you know, the who pays and who gets it. So it doesn't necessarily all go to the plaintiff. It's supposed to just deter. 
So maybe you could do something else with it. So I'm, I'm actually quite interested in exploring some of those options. And there's one that I didn't have time to get into by uh, David Rosenberg, professor at Harvard Law School. That's an entirely new system that just collectivizes the whole thing. It's not private. They have to, the government, the courts have to auction off the right. It's very clever. It's, I don't think it'll ever happen, frankly, but it's very clever. They auction off the right to bring the suit to private plaintiffs. They have to bid to get it. And, and I won't go any further, but and it also has decoupling, and the, and the money will go somewhere. He's the one that proposed Social Security, so I just you know, mentioned that. But it could go, any, it could go other places. I, I think it's novel to think about, but um, I think that'll stop there. Um, and ask for a student question. You were warned. Yeah. <laughs> Yes? Um, in the cases that you've had experience with, um, the companies that have engaged in this corrupt uh, action, have they been mostly motivated by reaching expectations that were like, projected for them, or has it just been mainly greed by people? Greed. Yeah, they, it, I, I think the way Ed described it was right. You know, they, they, they're making this really terrible calculation. <laughs> Should we break the law to make more profits? We live in a fallen world. Adam Smith in the Wealth of Nations said it's rarely a time when people business don't get together that the, the dis discussion doesn't turn to some contrivance against the public well-being. And he's talking about price fixing effectively. We live in a fallen world, so yeah, it's just, they make more profits that way. Daniel. I kept on going in my mind to OPEC and the fact that 15 nations control 60% of the oil supply and what can antitrust do about that? Is there anything, I was reading about the Sherman Act, people are talking about expanding that to allow actions to be taken against OPEC, and I'm not sure, like, can the U.S. government do anything to alter price fixing in the oil market within the United States? That's a really good question. Uh, let me take a stab at it. Um, there is no international law that governs this. I mean, we have treaties, we have other things about certain kinds of behaviors across national boundaries, but we don't have uh, a global Department of Justice, as it were. Mm -hmm. Now, we have, a lot of the cases I've been involved in and were listed on, on some of the slides were global cartels, CRTs, I think EBDM, uh, all kind, there's a lot of them, um, bulk vitamins. I mean, there, there's things that have just been worldwide, um, LCD panels and so forth. Uh, what we do is we prosecute here, they, they frequently have U.S. affiliates, and then they actually perpetrate it within our borders, but we can only handle it here. Actually, in the CRT's case, there was a U.S. case. I was in the Canadian case, actually. Um, so it's just handled separately, but this is a, a, an agreement across uh, manufacturers in different countries, so there is no international law that prohibits it. And, uh, but it's the same, but we see what the effect of it is, and, and price has actually tumbled because the, the cartel was falling apart, but once they got it back together, and then prices start to go back up. So it is a good example, but we don't have a legal regime that would stop them at present. Now, could, they, could we do something across international borders? Maybe. Yeah. Uh, you'll have to forgive my lack of knowledge on the subject, but uh, so I came up with this hypothetical um, and it has to do with incentive, like people's incentive to ma maximize their profits. Um, I said, say there's a cartel that has, you know, 100% of the market, um, they can't, like, they're producing, they're, like what you said, it's, it's fungible. Um, and there are four companies in that colluded, um, for the colluded product. Um, if I was one of the four companies in the cartel, wouldn't my incentive drive me to leave the cartel, drop my price slightly lower and capture a much higher percentage of the market share than the 25% that I'm currently receiving by participating in the cartel. Simply put, uh, in regards to incentive to maximize my revenues, how can cartels exist in a free market like in the United States, um, in a free market structure when there are no government barriers to entry? Okay, that's a great question. I got asked that by an attorney one time. And there is an answer. So what, uh, you heard Dr. Noel mention something about prisoner's dilemma. And that's, this is, 
the prisoner's dilemma. And so I teach this. Some of you have, have tortured with this. Um, and so, yeah, it looks like, they, they ask me this, isn't there an incentive? Because they're even trying to argue that this couldn't have even happened. It's like, no, 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 I get to assume it's true. It happened. We're just talking about class certification. But they're going to what we call the merits in this question. Wouldn't it fall apart? And the, the prisoner's dilemma would suggest that it would, except we've seen some of these hold together for five years and 10 years and 15 years. So what's going on? Well, the prisoner's dilemma, exactly what you're saying, uh, is a one, we call it a one-shot game. But let's suppose we would like to do this for years. <laughs> That's the way we maximize our profit. If you cheat, we're the, we're the cartel, and you've been part of it, but you go and undercut us, then it falls apart. And we've lost years of profits, which you didn't put into your computation. But once you've gone out, then it's like, oh, just kidding. Let's form it again, and you know, now I know. No, if it's, we call it an infinite live, it doesn't have to actually be infinite, but if it's going to be multi-year, that incentive is eroded pretty quickly. Because what you're doing, you're going to cheat. Now, of course, you, you may not really cheat. You may not gain much. Because you undercut us, we have to lower our price. We get to the competitive result in the prisoner's dilemma. So you're, you're actually earning zero economic profit, we would say. You, we've gone back to competition, or whatever it was in, in an oligopoly. But it, it would be lower profit for you than had you stayed in. So it's, it's a little illusory to say, I could undercut it. Yeah. Technically, that's correct. That is the description of the prisoner's dilemma. But you'd be shooting yourself in the foot if you otherwise could have had a prolonged conspiracy. So we could say it's a difference between a one-shot game. This is game theory. You take, take Enrico's course. Uh, it's a one-shot game versus an infinite time horizon game. Did you teach that? I did. <laughs> I was going to start making plugs for all of our courses. You know, uh, it's, it's just shameless. But, uh, other questions? There was. Well, th this is a very simple question from a historian. So I'm just fascinated by how, how do these cartels form themselves? Yeah. And if there's evidence that they've engaged in price fixing, that is, you, you have the emails, or you bug the room, or some such thing from a movie, <laughs> haven't they broken the law at that point? And if they've broken the law, Why would we need to show damages to anyone? They've broken the law. And so at that point, shouldn't they be subject to fines or imprisonment? And at the moment, I'm feeling like imprisonment is the way to go. <laughs> having, having just heard on, on NPR, driving over here, how nobody from the Wall Street fiasco of 10 years ago ended up in prison. All these companies have paid huge fines and the deterrent is Zippo. You know, they can just do the same thing again if Bank of America, this big entity pays <coughs> millions of dollars and they just go on. So at the moment, I'm thinking, throw the bombs in jail. <laughs> but why, why is it not just a matter of people showing up with the evidence that they've colluded and, and, and that's all that's necessary <coughs> in order to pursue uh, either a fine or imprisonment. Okay. So that throwing the bones in jail is a remedy under Section 7 of the... Yeah. <laughs> and, and I'm... And I'm, and I'm sorry, I, I thought I was... It's, it's used... It's, 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 I, th I think it's verbatim. It's yeah. throw the bums in jail. Exactly. Yeah, I think that's right. And, I, and I'm sympathetic to this, to be honest with you. That's why I said, you know, until you make it so they can't play golf. Now, the difference is uh, legal standards under criminal and civil law. And I'm about to tell you more than I know. I have a PhD in economics, I don't have a JD, but uh, I can pretend. Uh, so in, cr in criminal law, yeah, it's just if they did the deed. It didn't even have to have had an effect. Yeah. And I wrote a paper about this once you know, to Oliver Williamson and, and uh, just said, well, I was involved as, a, as a, my first case was actually a graduate student and I helped somebody else. I wouldn't have taken that case, but I was just doing grunt work and then I realized, no, these guys did it. I and mean, we were on the defense side. And, but, uh, the, other, the argument on the other side was, yeah, but it didn't have an effect. Well, that might make a difference in a civil suit for damages, if that holds up. It might or it might not hold up. But if it were true, then okay, then there's no damage payments made. Well, but on yeah, the criminals... It's like saying attempted murder isn't a crime because you missed. No, it's a crime. Yeah, I know. So and so, they, so this is too. Wrong. No, no. 
no, no. It didn't have any effect. Let me finish. Civil and criminal. Yeah. That was civil. You, you need to show damages. Yeah. But in criminal, just my statement was all you have to do is do the deed, even if there's no effect. Yeah. So you're right. That, that would be enough. The problem is we don't catch them very often. You may sound like, you know, like oh, do, do we caught them with you know, bugged rooms. So, by the way, that's what Mark Whitaker did. He ended up being a, an informant and he, 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 you know, they bugged the rooms. They, they met together all over the world to, to fix these prices of lysine and high fructose corn syrup. And so lysine. that would be uh, a common way they would do it. Such a yeah, series so. of meetings. Yeah. So, yeah, in CRTs, I couldn't believe it. When I got in the CRTs case, the cathode ray tubes, at um, some point they finally, they let me know that they had minutes to the conspiratorial meetings. <laughs> I said, you got to be kidding. <laughs> I said, how many? 500. And then had minutes. There, some of the meetings were the high-level ones where they set the prices. And the, all the, most of them were policing it. And this, this goes back to, this is why, you know, you, you make sure that people aren't cheating. And they, they could call it an enforcement mechanism. And they would go make sure they're abiding by the, by the agreed upon prices. And the, you have, they have to also shrink the quantities and they agree to all, because if they supply too much, prices come down. So they have to agree to shrink up the quantities to raise the prices. That's how monopolist works. So most of them are for that. And they're always signed by the person taking the minutes, respectfully submitted. You know, you know, unlawfully submitted. You know. um, <laughs> It's 500 meetings. I just said, yeah, I can help you. <laughs> you know? um, but some of these, you know, some of the times we just don't know, you know, how, this is your original question is how do we find out about these things? It's really difficult. Sometimes somebody has a conscience. So, and another time, just by mistake, two guys conspired and then he, one guy's called a salesperson for him down in some, some region. He goes, what would happen if we raised our prices? We're going to get killed by the other company here. No, no. What if, they're going to raise their prices too. What if they raise their prices too? <laughs> He just didn't feel good about it, and so he went to his own attorney, because he's thinking, maybe I'm getting in the middle of something here. His attorney, well, if, if it's after a crime has been uh, committed, then, they're, then you have a confidentiality agreement, right? The, you know, attorney-client privilege. But if a crime is in the making, attorneys are friends of the court, he had to go to the Justice Department and say, it looks like something's brewing. Mm -hmm. And that's how they found out. So, and then, yeah, and then sometimes it's just really stupid mistakes. I mean, this is like world's you know, dumbest criminal sometimes. I'm sure Professor Asher would be more than happy to dialogue with you here, or if you just go out the front door there, you'll find some goodies that you can have an extended conversation. Let's thank all of our presenters.